If you thought the sell-off in the last 15 minutes of the session was a precursor to a four-day losing streak, wrong. Buy the dippers came in in the last minute, and they've been bidding all night long. Maybe they like the Merck drug news. That might be the biggest move in Merck I've ever seen. We'll analyze the price action in that. Carnival Cruise Line has some earnings. GME, not so good on its earnings front. Tim Seymour, 835. We'll figure out what's going on in the marijuana sector. It's hump day. It's Wednesday. It's pre-market prep. Welcome to Benzinga's pre-market prep. This is a volatile puppy here. It's all about execution styles and strategies. All right, team, up 18 handles, 52, 83 and a quarter. Never even sniffed that closing price of 65 and a quarter. Uh, the buck down four pennies, trying to get in a 104 handle, 103.95. Bonds up a quarter point. It's about the third day in a row I've said that at 119 and 26, 30 seconds. Crude quiet down 35 cents, 81.27. Gold over 2200 up 970, 2209, 10. Silver, laggard up a couple pennies, 2464 in Bitcoin. That's in the 70K handle. That's up $735 at 70,945. Uh, let's bring in uh, Triple D here and uh, see if he's recovered from daylight saving. No, I haven't. This is ridiculous. Oh like, when do you actually, like, right? I always wake up 6.30, no problems at all. Now I'm sleeping in past 7. And I swear, this is all because of daylight savings time. I just haven't adjusted yet. When do you actually adjust? It feels like it's been a month. A day. When was it? Two weeks ago? A day. A day. Not me. Yeah. I take a month to adjust. So, uh, honestly, I'm in the vote. Uh, maybe I just got to move to Arizona. Or they don't have daylight savings time anymore. But then I'd have to get up really early. So maybe I should actually move the other way so I don't have to get up so early. I'm just not. I guess I'm not a morning person. All right. Let's bring in AB who probably doesn't wear a watch. Probably never looks at the clock. He's just going 24-7 working for Benzinga. I, yeah, he's a youngster. He doesn't. You know, what do you get? Like three, four hours of sleep That's all he night? needs. I, I I try to get a little bit more than that some nights, you know, but I I mean, I'm honestly, I'm with Dennis right now. I'm sleeping in the basement of my friend's house. So it's like extra dark. And this morning it was like, you know, I wake it up and it's super dark. And I was, I, was, I actually thought about you, Dennis. I was like, it's probably me and Dennis are the only people still dealing with this. Uh, time <laughs> you can't adjust right to daylight savings time. <laughs> No, but I, I wear, I mean, Joel, come on now. I wear an Apple Watch. I'm like you, I need it. You know why I need the Apple Watch the most is because when I'm swimming, I'm too dumb to keep track of once it's I get It's nice. Cat. It's nice to keep track of. The, it, it is nice. It's nice. I've done some distance swims lately, and it's nice not to be able to count. It's right. just nice to I, let it I, go. I, and I, just, oh. Oh. I would always get to like 52, 53, and then like on my next lap, I'm like, wait, am I on 60 now? I have no clue where I'm at. Now I can just check my watch, although it is it is kind of hard to check it while you're swimming. So I always got to, you know, then I got to stop, and then I check it, then I'm out of my groove. But all right, let's get to the market yep. this morning. Uh, we, we, you know, the, the title today is market on drugs. Usually I'm an expert on everything we talk about. I don't know anything about drugs, guys, but uh, we have Merck today. Some a big move in a company like Merck, which usually doesn't move, you know, too much. It's usually more of a yeah. slow moving stock. Um, but the company did the FDA approved Merck's drug for rare, a rare, deadly uh, lung condition. Um, so there's about 40,000 people in the U.S. living with this disease for pulmonary or arterial hypertension i think i'm saying that right i'm not sure i'm pretty good to me yeah pulmonary i know i'm right on the art art artery arterial arterial one of the two i don't know but forty thousand people so it seems like it's not even that big of a market opportunity but a lot of times when companies put out a drug for one of these like rare deadly diseases where there's no cure for uh they do get a nice pop so you're seeing merc trading higher we do have other news in the drug space but let's stick to merc for now what do you guys think about this move well, it's been a stock that has lagged, you know, if you're comparing it to Lilly or any of the other, you know, drugs that are obviously in the obesity trade. It hasn't really done much, but it's held up. I mean, valuation on Merck has always been somewhat reasonable, a lot lower than a stock like Lilly here. And I've argued that they need to figure out, you know, how to get in this obesity trade. But maybe if they're going to get these drugs approved for these rare 
diseases here. Maybe they got their own thing that they're cooking here. Um, stock is in a breakout. This is actually, I believe, an all-time high. Oh, for yeah. Me. Oh, yeah. So we're oh, breaking yeah. out through the 130. Let's see, you know, what you need to do when you're buying a breakout. What the critical thing is, is that the stock keeps breaking out. If you get, like, it opens at 131 and a half and then starts trading below 130, that's not what you see, want to see on a breakout because the 130 is the breakout number here. If you're buying a breakout, you need to see it keep breaking out. So just be careful when you're trading breakouts because breakouts can become fakeouts. It's just a big move for Merck. And maybe it's going to oh be the move, God. you know, that's going to continue to drive it. But a 5% <laughs> move for Merck is a big move for Merck. Oh, man. I could just uh, uh, look at the average daily range. I don't even need to look at it. I mean, going back over the last... Usually it was a move, buck. Yeah. The, the, oh, yesterday, uh, it was a, like a buck and a quarter. That was the range yesterday. This movie six times as much. Uh, full. Do you still have this one, Triple D? Because I, I have oh, this. had Merck a long time on my long-term portfolio. I got rid of it. Oh, man. I, I think around 100 bucks or something. I had bought this back, again, when I bought my Lily, in, and I bought this mm -hmm. back. I think it was like 50 or 60 bucks. It might have even been less than that. It might have been $30. I bought it a number of years ago. Had in the portfolio for a lot of years. It was a good one. It was paying me a 5% dividend, yeah, I'm, which yep. obviously that dividend's dropped substantially because the stock has gone up. And, you know, it was giving me some capital appreciation. Merck and Lilly were two good stocks in my long-term portfolio for a very long time. I just felt like they had run and had their run. And, you know, they did cool off a little bit. But then, obviously, the Lilly trade got ignited by the obesity drug. Um, and obviously, you know, buying and holding maybe is, works better sometimes in your long-term portfolio than looking at it and thinking, well, well that's enough know, money. I'm, I'm just going to give you another one lesson here, okay, yes, in this please stock, do. okay? Because I remember buying this, and if you look at the monthly here, I know exactly when I bought it. I bought it uh, right in late 21. And it was, I remember buying it at $85. And I looked at it at the end of the next month, and I said, I'm not going to look at it anymore. Sometimes it the best down, thing to do. It, it went down like 10, 15 bucks, never added to it. And then uh, not, they, I mean, if I was ever thinking of selling it, it would be today, but I'm not going to sell it. Pre-market high, 132 and a quarter. I mean, if anything, Dennis, I mean, how many, I know you don't have your New York book anymore, but I mean, it's traded 300,000 shares. I, I mean, can this... I mean, if this thing opens up over 132. I think it I, can. I, I, it can. If it opens over 133, I will walk on my hands. Down the line, <laughs> so don't anyway, do it. Don't say to it. To the office. Things the open line. wherever the hell they want to open. If and sometimes you get some crazy moves. And though it's not absurd to think. You're I just will. saying that there's going to be some orders in the book that may hold down the opening print. And that might be accurate. And maybe it's going to be a buy off of that. But. I just, I don't know. This is not an AI stock. This is not an obesity stock. This is a stock that's obviously had a drug approved. It's a big move for Merck. So just giving a perspective. Huge. I'm not sure I'm coming in and chasing this one. We'll say that. So Put some more. Some if more... I had 125 weeklies uh, or <laughs> anything, I'd be, I'd be like, sell, 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 sell. Sell short the stock against your weeklies. And remember, folks, you know, I keep, t I say this about once every couple of months. When you're long options and you're like, oh, I wish I could sell my options right now. Remember, you can always short the stock against your call option and lock in the price. I mean, if you're long the 125 calls, you can short the stock in the pre-market at 131.70 or 131.65 yeah, right now and lock yourself in the six and a half bucks. Now, you know, maybe you don't want to do that. If you're long longer dated calls, you probably don't because you're giving up time value on that trade. But I mean, it's not only that. You short the stock against it and if it comes in, then you can actually participate in the downside if it started to fall, really fall. But um, there's there's lots of different ways to play it. It's too many people just, you know, buy options. And I mean, if you're buying options at Robinhood and they don't lie to short stocks, they don't even give you that option. And maybe this is a good segue. I know I don't want to go to Robinhood maybe right away, but it is another storied it, stock today. But, um, you know, let's go I to think... Drugs. I think let's, go, let's stay on drugs. Let's go to it was going to be a great segue, though. It was going to be a great segue. Oh, really? But we'll, we'll, we'll burn it. We'll oh, burn no, no, it down. No, no. Stay on the drugs, Moderna. I don't no no do the segue, Dennis. Now I feel bad. Yeah, let's go back to the segue. Right, let's segue. restart. Re reverse, reverse. Let's act like going right. to the segue. And I don't even remember what the segue was. What I was saying is, instead, maybe, maybe uh, Tanev should stop worrying about so much about credit cards and all the other things, and maybe should allow his 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 people. And again, maybe they have already, but I don't think they have. 
Maybe they just should get a better lender and they should actually allow them to short stocks at Robinhood. Why? Question to the chat. You guys are all have Robinhood. Why are they not allowed to short stocks at Robinhood? I don't understand. It's not that difficult. Like this is a professional brokerage here. Why don't they allow them to short stocks at Robinhood? Because you miss out on all these strategies. If you are long calls, short stocks against it to hedge yourself up. I mean, there's so many different, like people think shorting is evil. It is just a lot of, like I use shorting primarily as hedging tactics. I mean, if you're running a hedge fund, how do you run a hedge fund? Like they want me to bring, you know, they keep advertising, bring millions of dollars over there. Oh yeah, I'm going to bring millions of dollars over there. I'm running a hedge fund, meaning I'm hedged. I mean, equal longs, equal shorts. So how the hell do I run a hedge fund without shorting stocks? It's not that easy. I mean, you can say, oh yeah, I'll buy the triple SQQQ or I'll buy this or buy that. You don't need any of that stuff. Why not just allow people to short stocks? I don't get it. It can't be that hard. Can't have, um, listen Carmen to says me. Citadel can't be that hard. says no. Carmen says Citadel says no. Citadel says no. That's <laughs> yeah. not true. That's just kidding. <laughs> Kenny wants you to short stocks. It's more money for him. He wants you to trade more. Yes. Kenny, I can't believe Kenny didn't push this more. Kenny wants you in there, man. He wants you buying, selling, shorting. The more you trade, the more Kenny the goat makes. Okay. All right. Okay. So we'll, that we'll was my. Do... So you can take it back if you want to go to Moderna, or we can talk Robinhood because they're doing credit cards. Let's let's we got Hood's chart up. Let's stick with Hood for a second. I mean, Hood has been on a tear recently. Now above twenty dollars a share. This thing was what an eight dollars? No, wow, it got down to five bucks at one. Or no, hold on, my chart's all screwed up. But it got down to you know low single digits at one point, uh, or eight dollars in October twenty twenty three. Yeah, lower than that. Um. But yeah, the company held a keynote event last night where it announced some new things, including a real gold credit card. Users can get a credit card from Robinhood that's like actual gold. It reminds me of when the Apple card first came out, which was like a, a real cool metal card. And I actually got it because I thought it was like super cool. And then, you know, the, the buzz kind of wore off after having it for a few days and it was too heavy in my pocket. So I had to get rid of it. Um, but Robinhood has been announcing uh, a lot of new features recently. A new 3% cashback gold card. I mean, the stock's up 7% this morning. In addition to this, in the last few months, Robinhood has also announced a 1% match if you transfer a portfolio over to Robinhood. Now, there is a lockup period, but say you have, you know, a million dollars. Okay, maybe that's a little too much. Say you have $100,000. But say you have $100,000 at Interactive Brokers and you transfer it to Robinhood. Boom, you just got a free $1,000 from Robinhood. Yeah, free, free, free $1,000. Uh, another thing that I like that Robinhood has been doing is if you just have cash sitting in your portfolio, and I think other brokerages are doing this too, though, uh, it'll give you interest payments on the cash. So, like, if I started just getting my my check direct deposited to Robinhood, I'd be making more money than getting it deposited in my Bank of America checking account. Um, now, again, like, these things are all just new features that Robinhood's adding. And, of course, the user data, the transactions have been rising because of crypto's resurgence over the past few months. So you have kind of all these things working together for Robinhood and helping push it back up above $20 a share. Um, I mean, I, look, I'm a Robinhood user, to your point, Dennis. I wish, yeah. we could sh I wish we could short stocks on there. I think a lot of people see that you can buy puts on there as like, oh, I can at least get short a little bit and maybe that helps curb the appetite for it but i think yeah. down the road you will eventually see robin hood add that feature as more and more people ask for it well it's ridiculous that they don't have that feature with this many customers there's got to be something else behind the scenes that's holding it back but i mean every brokerage house you know like you just go to any you know like they all allow shorting you know for the most part like who doesn't? Who else doesn't allow shorting of stocks? Maybe some of these other smaller what about retail Weeble? platforms. Does Weeble? Does Weeble? I, I don't know. Like don't we know, know Trade either. Zero does. You know they're small. Like like how? Like there's lots of you know different you know opportunities out there. I mean, I just think it's so limits. Like we're we're he's focusing on this and that and this and that. That's a simple one. And maybe they just think there's no money in shorting. But I don't know how you hedge. Like I don't know how does he expect? And I see this ad all the time. Maybe the one you're talking about. One percent, and he says, even bring over a billion dollars, and we'll give you one percent. Nobody's bringing you a billion dollars, Vlad. I tell you, actually, if you're gonna be a hedge fund, how you long, you gotta, dollars, how long do you got to keep it there? Because you know, I you, think it's like two years. Okay. Oh, okay. Because I've mean, I like, transfer, time. you know, like you know, a little chunk of change in, get it, and then transfer it out, you know. But uh, I guess I don't uh, get it. 
I don't, I don't get, get it. To you. I don't get it. I just it. want a couple things on this. I well, mean, it's actually a three percent match on IRA transfers. So that's I mean, again, if you have like a big IRA, three percent's not nothing. That's to, a lot. You have to keep your Robinhood Gold subscription for at least one year after you make the qualifying contribution. So I mean, again, if you weren't it, like if you were like, oh, I'm just gonna park my IRA and and you know some like bonds or something for the year, take my five percent, then you get the extra three percent from Robinhood for the year, and then you want to transfer it back, like. I don't know. I mean, it's kind of free money on the table, but it does seem like a lot of work. Uh, and again, like you got to do that lockup period. But somebody uh, said e trade doesn't allow shorting. That's not right, is it? No way. E trade must. Know. It's been you out know, for I, so many years. I just want to just talk this quote real quickly about this one. And just like I can remember, I, I think I really screwed this one up. I think I tried to buy it with Op. This is a long time ago because all these analysts were lower. Like I, I'm looking at a point here on my pro and I can uh, move it over here, you know, because analysts, you know, we talk about them being right and being wrong. I mean, look at all these people lowering their price target. There was one, two, three, four, five, six in a row, six lowered price targets. When they say, I think someone even came out with a sell rating on it or something. Um, and I and I remember, I'm like, oh, this is a fade. And I don't know. I think I did it too short term. We'll just yeah. give you the current action here. It's up a buck thirty seven. Uh, the pre market high comes in at twenty one and a quarter. This is great. This is a move over twenty. You have a bit over 20 oh, since the end of 2021. Don't know how that price action is going to play out today or longer term, but sure would like to see this establish a strong 20 bid. I mean, it's one to be up here today, up a buck 40, fly around, hit 2170, trade down 19 and a half. But you need people to step up here at uh, a bid here at 20 bucks. But pre market high, 21 and a quarter. Okay, they're, they're getting feisty in there. They want us to stop talking. I know, they don't about like this, they don't, Let's go back. They don't like they're feisty. Let's go back. Really? Let's go. Let's well, go let's back. Uh, the chat only gives us two minutes max of stock when we take over five. And they I know really what? Want. It's good. They really, keep us really on want. track. Because <laughs> we go on tangents. And all no. I would talk about is, you know, like sports and hockey and, you know, Oilers big win last night. And so this is good. You know what track I want to talk about? Track. Oh, I hit a parlay last night. The bridge the bridge <laughs> oh, did you? From, yeah. Let's talk about you the bridge parlay last night. from yesterday. So we're all having our own conversation here. <laughs> all Dude, three of us are talking I, yesterday, to yesterday I Yesterday, people in the chat were talking about the economic impact of the bridge, and I wanted to hold off on that conversation because they were still looking for people, and uh, uh, yeah. you, you know, and it's like a tragedy. Too. And I, I'm like, it I don't want to, I, I don't want to talk about the inflation implications while they're searching for people. Um, but it is a big yeah. deal. I mean, people it are now horrible. talking about. Uh, you know, uh, our infrastructure again, which I saw a lot of people trying to make it about like, oh, the structural integrity of the bridge. Look, when you have a... Uh, it crashed a, into it. Right. You yeah. have like a 10-pound truck, right? If like a bus crashes into your house and your house falls down, it's not because your house was, you know, not built properly. It's because a bus crashed into it. So, horrible. Um, but, you know, I mean, you know, there is some infrastructure, you know, talk yeah. and obviously the uh, shipping, you know, uh, that bridge was used for a lot of transport. So people are Huge worried work. that, yep. uh, thank you know, goodness it happened at one 30 in the morning though, because oh my a God, lot yeah. less traffic, like imagine this happened in rush hour at seven 30 in the morning. Yeah. I mean, could you imagine ter terrible, but yeah. Um, what, I just what, have a question. What was it even doing? Like, it's not a, it's not a drawbridge, right? Like what the, was the, the doing ship, the ship ran out of power. And then so they couldn't they weren't supposed to run into the bridge, obviously, but instead of being able to like avert uh, divert the course or whatever, the, the boat ran out of power. So it basically within it did not have like the Ugh. ability to stop it before hitting the bridge, which I hope that means they were able to at least like alert. But I don't know how much time they had. It, it wasn't much time. I've read way too much on it. Now they, they set out at May Day and. And it, it's it's bad. OK, let's let, let, let's go back. Let's go back to the other stuff. Um, OK, that. no, you're good. So Moderna, we were talking about drugs. Moderna trading higher this morning, too, after uh, they have a few different vaccines reaching the primary endpoints in its phase three clinical trial. Uh, additionally, Blackstone Life Sciences announced it will invest up to seven hundred fifty million dollars to mm. support Moderna's influenza program. Uh, the company will also host an investor event today. So, uh, I mean, Moderna, like I, I think this company is really interesting long term because they're, you know, working on a lot of these things that could help with with a lot of different diseases. I know people still look at it as just a COVID play, 
Um, but again, getting a nice bounce this morning and really from a, a, a technical perspective, Joel, I'll let you speak on it. But I mean, after we made this bottom down in November 2023, it's been trading pretty well. So again, perking up this morning on positive news from its its vaccine uh, mm-hmm. reaching phase three. And these are not COVID vaccines. I want to reiterate that these are other yeah, types of down. vaccines. When, when they announce positive stuff for COVID vaccines, they stank them on that now. They're done with COVID. Yeah, COVID. So. I mean, come on. That's over. That trade's over. You can look at Pfizer's chart. You look at. And so that's what I'm saying. I like Moderna as not a COVID play long term. Yeah. Um, yeah. But again, I think a lot of people will still always just group this in as, as a COVID stock. And I mean, out of all the stocks that went crazy during COVID, this was this was one of the primary ones that got way too high. Uh, price action. I mean, this see, a, I've seen this move a lot of times, and a lot of times it gets faded. Don't know if that's going to be the case today. One twelve ninety nine is your pre market high. Um, if that's not good enough here, if you're looking for a longer term uh, level, I really like this one fifteen. You came up just shy in March in it, but that's the high for the year. That was the high back in September. So that room on the upside there. I like like the one fifteen dollar area. The monthly down here doesn't look too bad. It's had a couple uh, green candles. So uh, if you're waiting to buy this on a pullback or you're looking for a gap fill, 111.80 was the top of yesterday's range in Moderna. I have no um, comments. Let's move on from drugs because the chat's getting feisty again. So, All right. Well, let's talk yesterday. Biggest news story of the day, or at least in the markets, was got to be your DWAC to, to DJT yes. uh, stock. You know, absolutely took off. Trading up another 13% pre-market yeah. this morning. Um, Dennis, I know you had some, you tweeted last night looking at the, at the locate on interactive yeah. brokers. Uh, I mean, look like this is just, I don't really know what else to say about this other than you're in complete meme stock territory. You talk about yeah. that aren't trading with their valuation. Um, and you know, let, let's, let's call it what it is. You're basically buying like a, a meme coin or a meme stock that's not trading with a valuation. It's a way to either bet on Trump, if you want to buy it, you know, if you want to buy it to the long side or bet against it, if you want to short it, which you can't on Robin Hood. Um, but either way, you know, $66 now, I think that what's the valuation at? It's like 15, uh, or no pros telling me 7 billion, but I saw, I saw numbers way high. Maybe at the highs yesterday when it got to $79, I think it might've been eight or $9 billion on a company with $3 million in revenue, 3 million in revenue. Well, I don't even know what that is. 300 what is that? Three thousand times sales? I don't even know. I, I can't even. But it again, this stock, and I definitely am not, like got this one wrong because I was thinking this could be a sell the news event that did not happen. They absolutely ripped it when on the conversion stock went up to seventy nine. I think we topped out yesterday, but when stocks just you know disconnect from all valuation, you know this is like GameStop mode. So who knows where this party ends? We know it probably ends lower when we look at it a year from now. But the path to get there, it's very hard to tell. Um, I do think yesterday everybody got overly excited right off the hop. I do think that $79 is going to be tough to get back up there now. I think you've got a few people maybe caught just because it was a pretty vicious sell-off towards the end yesterday. But with that being said, when stocks disconnect from all valuation, be careful. Yeah, and I mean, like you said, Dennis, like there is probably a, a a big drawdown coming here at some point, but it's just so hard to time. And when you have a stock like this, and you have so many people piling in trying to short it, we've seen this story before. So, yeah. like the, the 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 easiest and best thing to do is just kind of stay away. But again, if you are going to trade it, just know. You, I've made you know, zero trades on this. I have not touched this in the last couple of days. I've traded DWAC before, but I have not touched it since it became DJT. Uh, one reason to I can't get a bar on IB. Um, I looked already. There's obviously lots of places you can, but in IB, they, they didn't have inventory yesterday. I'm sure they're going to get it. Um, the borrow also at IB, if you can get it, because I'm sure there's a few people that did get it before they ran out of inventory, 376% a year. So, I mean, shorts are like, <laughs> this is like people really want this, you know, borrow here. They're paying 376% a year, meaning the stock's got to go to zero in the next three months or, you know, you lose money no matter what. So if it stays at 370, it's hard to make money shorting stocks when the borrow rate oh, wow. is 376% a year. It's over 1% a day. So it can be like, oh, wow, what a trade. You know, I just made 1%. No, you didn't make anything because it cost you 1% to do that. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's just been a crazy move. And again, like 
as someone said uh, in the chat, like take that same logic to Bitcoin. It basically, I mean, it, it is. It's it's like you're, it's trading on nothing. It's it's basically just all speculation. So it is. You know, you can take that same logic to Bitcoin. What I'm saying is, it's I, even though I think it's overvalued and silly where it's trading at, not uh, you know, a sign of an efficient market that it's it's the market can stay. What, what's the quote? People are like, the market can stay inefficient Irrational way long. much longer than you can stay solvent. Right, and exactly. That's the perfect quote for this stock here right now, too, because the stock is definitely trading, you know, with no fundamentals whatsoever. But we saw before GameStop when it goes from 10 to 40 to 80 to 350 or wherever the hell it went before it eventually came back down and still not all the way back down to where it was. You know, AMC was the same thing from two to five to 70. And then, you know, all the way back down to pennies. But I mean, you know, <laughs> it's hard to hold through when these stocks are in rocket ship mode. So I've said this lots of times. When stocks, you know, are hot, when the story is hot, valuation is meaningless. So story is hot right now. Does it cool off? I think it's going to cool off faster than you think. But again, that story, the Trump story, the Trump stock is hot at least for a day. Uh, Dennis, if you want something to trade with this, um, do you see Rumble? I don't know if you've ever traded it. R-U-M. Uh, it's uh, another uh, network. I believe Barstool Sports is on it. I'm in it. it, I'm and, in it. I'm uh, in it right now. So have you ever traded it? I'm in it right now. The um, only reason I'm in it is because of the reports tonight. So you know how I like to be still on stocks. How did I, I pull report. that Have I ever out? traded it? I'm in it right now. <laughs> <laughs> but again, this is not a trade. This is just, you know, and yesterday worked really well. Rumble had a huge day yesterday. Again, that's core strategy. It's one of my core strategies, folks, just being long stocks ahead of reports. It's a stupid strategy. Calendar strategy is really what it is. But you know what? Yesterday, Rumble, what was it up? 15%? I mean, there's maybe, you know, everything was It was a huge moving. move on monster volume, too. I yeah, mean, and there's yeah. some news. like it, So it's, you know, again, maybe you're lucky with that one. But in some cases, you know, like just being long stocks ahead of reports, I tend to be long them. You know, and, and most, of, you know, I usually I'm long them overnight. I usually like the stocks overnight. And then, you know, I might get out and I get back in and get out and get back in. As of right now, at this current time, I'm long it, but usually I sell those things, and I'll probably sell it near the open. I thought um, you were going to say, "Oh, that's not in my university of stocks." That I no, I'm in it. And and again, to to Spinner's point, it was probably up on 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 the Trump stock. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, I looked, yeah. I, yep, I looked at it right away. Yeah. And there's been a number of these media companies. I mentioned it yesterday. You know, Parler, Gab, Rumble. Uh, you know, True Social now that all try to be kind of this alternative to the right social media. Um, and you know. I think from a business perspective, it's it's not unfair to say that they haven't, uh, you know, really worked out that well. So, I mean, True Social, maybe with all the buzz it's getting now, maybe it'll get a few more users. But still, I mean, 5 million active users, $3 million in revenue trading at, you know, $7 billion. We'll see. Someone in the chat did uh, put the, say, Donald Trump's lockup period was about six months in this. So, uh, maybe you'll see a lot of shorts coming in right before Donald Trump's lockup period ends, just because it, it's, uh, you know, he's probably going to have to sell some of this to pay for some of the other stuff. But um, let's move on from this. I did want to talk about yesterday. Uh, Nvidia was pretty weak yesterday when looking at the overall tech market, closing down two and a half percent. We got some more clarity on uh, some of the China chip news. I don't think that helped it, but I think it might have just been some uh, buyer exhaustion here. Uh, do you guys, I mean, Dennis, we talked about this yesterday. If, if NVIDIA was basically inevitable on the 1000, was yesterday's price action just a, a short little bump in the road? Or is this, you know, potentially kind of a, a little short term top? You don't want to see it reverse where it did. And Joel's probably going to talk about that. It got yeah. up to the previous day's high and then failed. So you don't ever want to see that. I mean, and it didn't make a new high on the move. So those are two warning signs. Um, I just think the story here is still so early that if I had it on for a trade, would I ring the register? Probably. Um, but I've got it in the long-term portfolio. And you know what? If I sold NVIDIA every time, you know, it started, you know, having a bad candle, like, you know, I would have been out of this 300 points ago. So, you know, the 500 to 600 is pretty easy. But then you had 700, he came down, and then you had the earnings report in there. And you had lots of, you know, times where it's looked like NVIDIA's story is going to roll over and then it goes down 30 40 50 bucks and they just buy right back up so i don't know if this is the end of the nvidia story i don't think i have no crystal ball but i don't think it is and that's why i'm continuing to hold my lawn uh new number uh that old time closing high was made on monday at 9 50 so if you know if you didn't sell it on the way up you thought huh 
I'm looking good when it hit 963.75, but when it came back down through it, it's a little better number now. But that's really the only thing. It's kind of a double top, but not really. I mean, it's four bucks in between. So I think you do have a seller stocking the 965 area. Uh, one day we did get up to 974, but I, that's where I think your seller is congregated now. And then today, if you're looking to wiggle out at that old time closing high price, uh, that would be nine fifty point oh two for that's still twenty bucks away. But the way this puppy moves, you could you could definitely get that. Uh, well, we talk about Nvidia, and of course, the leader of the AI tra- the AI story and the AI trade. Uh, but Nvidia, I mean, you know, back to its roots, got big as a graphics card company for gamers, for people that like to build their own computers. And speaking of video games and gamers, we did have GameStop report earnings last night after the close. Sales came in at $1.79 billion, missed the $2 billion estimate. EPS came in at $0.22, cents, missed the $0.29 cent estimate. A uh, company says recently undertaken cost reduction measures to improve the efficiency of their operations, including initiatives to reduce headcount during fiscal year 2024 week. Uh, and so, I mean, stock got hit on this. I I don't want to say I called it, but I did say yesterday that, you know, if you looked at the past history of GameStop's reports, it tends to to move lower, at least in the last few years. So down 18 percent, 12 bucks now. I mean, I don't know if this story is officially dead or not, but it's it's feeling closer to dead than it was. It feels like it's never officially dead, but I mean, the stock's whole time high is one hundred and twenty dollars. You're now twelve bucks. You're now down ninety percent from the all time highs. And what I've said, when stocks fall ninety percent from their all time highs, they usually don't come back. Sometimes they do, but they usually don't. So I mean, the story here is definitely ice cold. Is it over? Is it going to get ignited again? Are the memesters going to grab? Did they try to grab it for a day? And look, that trade again. Being long stocks ahead of reports wow. from 13 to 15.50. I mean, there's big money in that two day candle there just ahead of the report and then dump it before it reports. Don't dare hold them through the reports. You know, sometimes you get lucky, but it's more coin flip territory. And obviously, in this case, they didn't like it. With that being said, it's GameStop. The memesters will come in. They're like, ah, oh, we're not going to let this thing go down. They're probably going to try to put up a stand <laughs> or something like that. So I don't know. It's its own story. They, you know, it's GameStop, it's its own story. And if I say uh, something negative about yeah, it, then yeah, they're probably going to be mad because I said it's probably not coming back and everybody believes it's coming back. Don't look at your Twitter today. Uh, the yeah, level I got was... five tweets at me already probably with hate. <laughs> uh, I was going to give you 1183 just because that was your low back in November. Uh, I think people are stalking that number as you only went to 1201. So I call 12 theoretical support here. Uh, and wow, the bottom of yesterday's range. I don't know if we'll see, but uh, I don't know. Let's see. This needs to establish a 13 bid. You did have buyers at 13 uh, back, uh, you know, three, four, five days in a row. But now 13 is going to be resistance, potential support at 12. Yeah. And, and just before we move on to uh, from GameStop, I did see. Uh, unbelievable in the chat, which is kind of unbelievable. The the uh, one point seven billion dollars in sales isn't is no joke. Which I mean, I, I you know it might be silly to talk about the fundamentals for a stock like GameStop, but I am surprised by that. You know, I I I don't game as much as I used to. I still have a PS4, and the PS5 has been out for like hmm. three years now. Um, but everyone just buys games straight from the console now. You can just download it straight from your PS4. You don't need to go into GameStop. And in addition to that, it seems like a lot of the popular video games are moving toward this freemium Fortnite model where you can download the game for free and then they make money through in-game purchases. Dennis, I'm sure you know you know about this from your kids if they're begging you to buy stuff on Roblox or something like that. Um, but you know, you download Fortnite for free and then you pay for skins, etc. Like I just don't understand really, I guess, where a lot of these sales for GameStop is coming from. I'll have to look into that. But again, uh, I mean, if, if GameStop keeps getting beat up and their sales stay above a billion dollars, it could potentially be worth looking at eventually. But I just don't think right now is the time. Let's look at the valuation here. I mean, you can't look at it on P because they don't make money. But just looking at sales, four point. So it's currently worth four point seven three billion dollars still. Twenty million in debt only because they paid a lot of that off, I believe. When they didn't, they do some offerings or something. So the debt isn't crazy there anymore. Um, yeah. So you know, sales. I mean. It, you're stretching to get any like you know when you're looking at a billion dollars in sales here you're, you're stretching on a retailer 
to say that's a cheap stock. It looks. You know what this really stock expensive. needs? You know what it needs? It what? needs a person. What person? Ryan Cohen. Well, that's who's right. in there. Is Ryan Cohen? Yeah. So. So I mean, it needs Ryan Cohen. There? I don't know. Maybe it needs not Ryan Cohen. I don't know. Yeah. But Ryan Cohen's the whole reason this stock went. You know, or the whole reason that this stock continues to probably hold up. Is he still, still in there? Yeah, he's yeah. still running it, isn't he? Ab, isn't he running the whole thing? I don't know. Like he's in there. He's on the board. I don't know. Is Ryan Cohen's Cohen still Cohen. actively involved in GameStop. I think he is. Okay. I didn't hear otherwise. Oh, I, I'm not yeah, 100%. Now, Cohen, Cat is the, Cohen is the chairman and CEO of GameStop still. Yeah, he runs the whole thing. Yeah, I, I, I was confused because I remember he got involved in like Bed Bath and Beyond a few years oh, ago. Oh yeah, and then he and gets he, out and he's yeah. this, and he uses his influence. I mean, there's no doubt he's you know he treats an ice cream cone, and that means buy memesters. I mean, you know, there's some definitely some you know. Some oh, the uh, the thing concerning that... activity I would say around <laughs> Ryan Cohen, but they've already investigated and looked into him, and I'm sure they're still looking. Yeah, well, we said it at the time when he did that Bed Bath and Beyond thing, where he invested in it and it got retail traders all into it, and then, and then he sold, sold it at the top. We said that he he had like one bullet in the chamber for that. He could do that one time. You do it twice, and you're like a dead man. You do it once, okay, people. You know, people won't won't forgive him, maybe, but they might, you know, kind of forget. But if he does it again, then he has that. Uh, and you know, then the next time he tries to do it, people just aren't going to buy the stock that he gets in, but let's move on from GameStop. See people in the chat, uh, ask him to move on from that. Remember he just said he was long one thing. What was it? He was, or was rumors he was going to buy, wasn't it Nordstrom or something like a position in that and the stock remember Joel and it popped like 30 bucks. I, don't even, I think it, it popped like 30. 30% just on the rumor that Ryan Cohen was getting involved. It was um, like, and I don't even think he was. Like, it was just, a, it was just a rumor. But it went from like twenty to thirty, like just like that. Yeah, just, that was just crazy. Yep. Like, I mean, at a certain point in time, Ryan Cohen very influential. Yeah, hundred percent. And they GameStop, people of influence. He's up there. Game at GameStop, least in the stock market. GameStop did announce that, uh, you know, a few. I don't know when this was, like a year or so ago, that they they changed company policy and they were going to allow Ryan Cohen to invest with company funds. So maybe that was their like last ditch effort to try to bring in some extra profit. Was like, here, Cohen, here, take take our billion dollars in revenue and invest it and try to make some extra money for it. So I don't know if that's still going on or if Cohen is trading, you know, buying and selling meme coins with with uh, GameStop funds still. If anyone in the chat has extra clarity on that, let us know. But all right. Let's move on from GameStop, a different yeah. type, different type of gaming. Uh, DraftKings gambling. Needham Needham maintains buy on DraftKings, raises price target to fifty eight dollars. Uh, you've got betting in the news a lot right now. I just saw on CNBC they had their uh, little title on there that said tackling problem gambling. Uh, you have this news about Shohei Otani. I don't know if you guys have been following that story, Ooh, but it's a crazy boy. story. Yeah, uh, and I don't know what the MLB. Dennis, are you are you caught up? On yeah, that? I know I the headlines, so I don't and dig into all the details. I saw well, him getting interviewed and talking about it, so, so I know the headline story. So basically, and I, we won't stick on this too long. We'll get to DraftKings, but basically, Shohei Otani. They're saying his interpreter was four and a half million dollars in gambling debt. Now, this was a guy who was making two hundred thousand dollars a year. So a lot of people are speculating that, okay, why would some illegal bookmaker give this guy four and a half million dollars of credit unless he was saying, you know, no, it's me, you know, Shohei's backing me, you know, we got it, he's bankrolling me. And uh, I mean, this could be a huge problem for the this MLB. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. I mean, you, you look back at the precedent, I mean, Pete Rose got banned for a lifetime. But now Shohei Otani is 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 the MLB's biggest asset. I mean, he's growing the game internationally. He's, yeah, worth, hard. he's worth hundreds of millions of dollars to the MLB. So it's hard to imagine that they crack down on him the same way. I mean, if this was some other guy that had an interpreter that wasn't as big of a name and he was even, you know, connected to this at all, I feel like they'd be yeah. very quick in it. But um, either way, DraftKings, of course, you got March Madness going on. You had yep. positive data after the Super Bowl with how many people bet. Price target raised to fifty eight dollars. The stock's been on a tear, up more than a hundred percent this year. I'm I'm worried about this whole industry, though. I gotta say. Uh, the, the, well, the thing just going on, Tani. I mean, he changed his story. I mean, that, I know that, that's yeah. a thing. So, I mean, uh, I don't know about that. Uh, but let's just talk DraftKings. A nice move here. Uh, the stock's been on just on a nice roll. Uh, an upgrade is an upgrade. It's like or a price target raise. So you did get a pop here to 49.67, 68, your pre-market high. 
you haven't been at 50 bucks in a while. In fact, you haven't been over 50 since uh, uh, September of 2021. So next monthly high comes in at 51.30. If you're looking for a target, that was in October of uh, 2021. Kramer also uh, featured it last night. Um, he had some technician he was talking about, and they were bullish the stock too. And that really kickstarted it last night a bit too. Although they did say wait for a pullback to buy, which he usually says, but nobody waits for a pullback; they just rip it higher. Yeah, and again, my you know, I, I've I what I from what I'm seeing, I see a lot of stuff. You know, a lot of young people have gotten into trouble now gambling on these legal apps over the last few years. My prediction is that in the next few years. I don't think they're going to make gambling illegal again. I think what you're going to see is a lot of regulations similar to like alcohol advertising and stuff where you, you know, or cigarette advertising where you can't. I think we're just going to see less and less of the commercials every, you know, you watch a sports game now and it's every single commercial break. It's DraftKings, FanDuel, this and that. And the leagues themselves and the media shows are all endorsing these products. So I think over time we'll see some pushback on that, but I don't think they'll fully, uh, you know, make it illegal now. So, I, I, I don't know. I mean, again, like the, the companies seem to be doing well right now. I just worry about long term, the problems that are going to arise from this industry. Um, yeah, I, I love parlays too, the crow. I mean, it's it's fun. It's fun if you do it responsibly. It's just like trading, right? Like you don't want to go on Robin Hood and, and go, you know, on $50,000 worth of margin you don't have and then be down in a hole. But if you'd want to go all in on Donald Trump. Yeah, go, go all in on DJT. So, um, you know, definitely yeah, no. an interesting story to watch. Someone else, there was another st gambling story. I don't want to stay on the news too much, but there was a Raptors player who got caught basically gambling on himself. He actually went, I went to college with him, Mizzou, and I know his family, and he's a you know good family, so I was kind of surprised by that. And he was actually a traitor. Jonte Porter, the player on the Raptors, uh, this one, this really? story, yeah, this story broke yesterday or two days ago. He, um, you know, he had like under, you know, people had parlays where they were, uh, betting on his under props, so like under three and a half rebounds, and he came into the game and then pulled himself out after four minutes with an eye injury, and it was all this like, you know, weird oh. betting trends, and it's yeah, it's bad. I mean, it's bad for him, but he ran a Discord where he was talking about like cryptos and meme coins and all this stuff. So when I learned that, I was like, okay, maybe he's got that that streak in him where he's kind of you know a, a gambler, like he wants to you know buy these coins or buy GameStop stock. So. He actually was an investor trader. So, I mean, you know, more relation to the markets there might be a little bit uh, more topical for us. But let's move on from the gambling as well. Um, let's see, where do we want to go next? Oh, let's go to Tesla next because we'd have some analysts. We have an analyst upgrade today after a few wow. downgrades. Mm hmm. Um, or wait, did the, did the upgrade come in yesterday? I think there was a couple. I think there was a couple of ratings changes today. Let's see. Let me get let me get those pulled up. I don't have an upgrade. Is there a buy rating? I'm just looking through. Price target rates, yeah. I believe. Tesla maintains overweight. Um, this is Morgan Stanley. This is Adam Jonas. 320. Uh, yeah, if it's Morgan Stanley in a car company, then chances are it's, it's, Adam, uh, it's Jonas. Adam Jonas. Oh, uh, Jonas is it looked like and I didn't read the note or anything. I'm just looking through my ratings in the pro there, but I see overweight. Tesla, I see a 320 price target. We know Adam Jonas. He'll have a 320 price target, and then he'll have a bearish scenario of like an $80 price target. The guy hedges himself, so I don't know. Adam Jonas, obviously. People listen to him, though, and I mean, if he's talking bullish on Tesla here again, it'll pop up the stock a bit. It is. Had a good day yesterday. Kind of faded near the end of the day because of that late-day sell-off. Just following the momentum. We did get through the pair of highs at the 183 level, uh, but faded, as I said, near the lows of the session. But, uh, you know, looking at it, trading up, touched 180 today. I don't know. Kind of, kind of no man's land here. Uh, yesterday, I look at yesterday's low and the close as support right now, uh, at uh, right next to each other. One seventy-seven thirty-eight, one seventy-seven sixty-seven for Tesla. China's just getting hammered here again. I mean, it just can't seem to get out of its own way. Every time you think Alibaba is ready, like it's looking like, oh, maybe it's perking up a bit. And I've been caught like thinking, oh, it's gonna perk up here a little bit. Just continues to leak. I mean, not too far from a 52-week low for Alibaba. That pin duo duo has been an epic disaster since the earnings report. We know in the pre-market was trading up over 150. Never opened that day and came all the way back down. I've got the position in Baidu, but that couldn't hold the gains here either. They got, you know, the, maybe the deal with Apple, a talking about rumored deal. You know, that, you know, has come back down here. 
what is it going to take? I just want to talk China here for a second. You know, what is it going to take to actually get a sustained rally in China stocks? Is it like just fears that they're going to go and invade Taiwan and you just can't touch it? And every time these things pop up, there is a sell because, you know, you get some pockets where, okay, well, this China stock's doing okay. But I mean, there's so many that are just not participating. The K web, you know, again, we've had a decent rally in the last couple of months, but when you give a perspective, the K web topped out at $97 in 2021 is now 26 bucks. I mean, it's been tough. I want to invest in China, but I mean, everything just tells me it's just been dead money for the last so many years. What makes this the year that China is actually going to start to outperform? Yeah, I see a headline from overnight from Financial Times that uh, Jinping tells U.S. CEOs China's growth prospects remain bright. So that's what I would actually like to see right now, Dennis, is that like I would like to see China's leadership kind of basically tell U.S. companies like, hey, look, like we still want you guys to do business here. We still want this to be a good place to do business here because everything we've seen over the last few years, you see iPhone sales plummeting because of increased competition. You see Tesla sales plummeting because of increased competition. It seems like a much more unfriendly environment for American companies to do business in China, which I think is what's hurting you more right now than this risk about Taiwan. Um, because I think people have kind of, I don't want to say forgotten about that, but it's a little bit more on the back burner than it was, say, a year ago, the Taiwan risk. Um, but I'm more worried about like, are, are companies just going to be saying, hey, let's not focus on China at all because it's not helping Apple. It's not helping Tesla right now. There's too much competition over there. So if China starts coming in and saying, giving essentially U.S. more friendly ways to do business there, then that would help. But I don't know if we're going to end up seeing that because it seems like they're pretty gun ho on growing their own uh, companies and, and Be businesses. Before we change the subject, Tim Seymour in the background here, let's bring Tim in because this is his area too, you know, talking um, uh, uh, Asia here. So let's bring him into this conversation. Joel, he has to mute himself. Joel, you're trying to run a professional show here. What's going on? Let's see. Where, where are my mutes here? No, you're good. Not you, not you. Joel, Joel, Joel does it once every are. three days. He has like what we call OMS, old man. Come syndrome. on, Joel. Jeez. <laughs> How you doing, Tim? Give him a good intro. Well, I, I show up here with a little bit of egg on my face because somehow, you know, the last time I was supposed to appear, um, you know, I, I don't know, there was some some type of voodoo that went on and uh, uh, I missed. I really apologize. This is this is one of my really enjoyable moments uh, before the markets every day, let alone being here. So uh, sorry about that, guys. Great to be here. I, I heard you talking about China. Yeah. And, and I Fuck. guess, it, you know, I, I have a. We, we all know what the fundamentals are. We all know that that the dynamics structurally around the economy are, are very challenged. We know that China's demographics, uh, strangely enough, for a lot of people to, to learn are, are awful. They're not they're not, you know, they're not extraordinary. The things that that I, I think are very interesting about China right now is I still believe China's playing a chess game when at times we're playing video games here. Um, and, and that means that they're just moving very slow and methodically it doesn't mean they're always right I, they certainly i don't believe in the ideology at all um i do think that they are playing a long game as it relates to american investment and for as long as they need american firms in their economy um they they will have them and they will have them on their terms but it can be certainly uh, mutually beneficial i've seen this in emerging markets over my years i certainly uh, understand how that works until it doesn't i i, I think the the investment rationale on china for most people that don't have to invest there is, I don't need to be in China, I'm not gonna be there. Uh, people are underinvested, they're underweight, the, the sentiment is as bad as I've ever seen it. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's going higher. And I think it's going higher because I think there are a few things going on that are the more important part about this than whether they're gonna throw uh, you know, 5 trillion yuan at their economy or not. It, it's, it's things like when Tencent yesterday said that they feel the government has taken pressure off, they're actually going to be able to alley, excuse me, Tenpei, um, so their version of Alipay or their version of their payments dynamic. I mean, the, their biggest companies, especially in the tech center, have been under attack from the government, not from anywhere else. Uh, and, and so it's not as if the U.S. is saying, get out of our, our markets. It's their own country that's been putting pressure on. Ten cents announcements yesterday made me feel, and we've heard this bits and pieces, and there's been a lot of inconsistent signals. Um, but we've heard this from Alibaba with their spinoffs. We've heard this even 
uh, when Joe Tsai was brought back in at, at Alibaba, I think that the message was that that you know folks that even have a big presence in the West uh, are people that are okay at these companies. So I like Tencent, I like Baba. I saw the shard of the K Web up there. Um, it's it's certainly been uh, danced by the door. It's been a trading stock, um, and and you know these other. I mean, we we've had probably. 10 rallies of 20 plus percent in Alibaba in the last two years. And they've been then followed by probably lower lows. Um, I, I just, you know, I look at Alibaba that's got 40% of the market cap in cash. Um, talking about buying back stock. I think the companies are doing what they can do. Tencent uh, amped up their, their, their buyback yesterday. Um, stock had a pretty good day in the middle of a difficult day for, for, for China overall. So those are my views on China. There's a lot to not like. Um, but but I, I think especially as China views uh, their capital markets, their global markets being a money center, um, they believe they are and, and they want that. And if you look at how they interact with the MSCI and, and places that really you know are all about institutional adoption, I mean, they, they, they've signed up to do all the right things that they need to do. So um, and if you look, by the way, global funds that are allocated to China, um, they are back to 2013 levels of, of aggregate investment in China. And that's before the MSCI put in, uh, you know, essentially the uh, the local markets, before China joined the MSCI world and MSCI EM. Um, and, and China's now 40 plus percent of the EM index. Um, to say that we're back at those levels of allocation tells you just where a little bit could go a long way in terms of asset prices. Let's take it over to the pot stocks because this is your area of expertise as well. And some of these stocks have actually been going pretty well. I mean, I've, I don't know how much you follow the Canadian ones. Some of the Canadian ones have really blasted off here. Yeah, in the last well, of weeks. Yeah, thoughts there. Yeah, I mean, the Canadian the Canadian companies love the fact that that Germany essentially has removed cannabis from narcotics. I mean, Germany's kind of like quietly moved ahead of the U.S. in terms of what they're doing. They may, in fact, fully federally legalize um, rec. Uh, the adult market before we do as well. But but uh, if you look at Canadian firms, they spent a lot of time, you know, back in 2018 and 2017 and even 2019, and, you know, when when the Canadian LPs market caps were uh, 10 times what they are. Uh, the part of the story was Europe, right? Part of the story was was that they, you know, especially Tilray uh, 1.0, Tilray 1.0 uh, was making a lot of noise about some of the deals that they had done uh you know and and some of the jvs they have with the Vardis and whatnot and and um but ultimately you know tilray 2.0 is a major is is the major distributor uh across europe they've major investments across uh, you know a couple of the key the key markets including germany obviously purely uh in the us uh, who's made a couple acquisitions recently has certainly made a significant investment in in germany and across europe i i think you know the canadian lp dynamic also is is uh, to the extent that where U.S. markets are going to open up, there, there's an argument that there's more to do for a couple of these companies. For most of them, I don't think there's a whole lot to do at all. Um, and in fact, I still think there's more consolidation to go on in Canada. I think there's way too much uh, capacity still, amazingly. But but in, in, in cannabis, obviously, what's interesting to me about yesterday is, is that you know, the headlines of Germany's move forward here um, are the types of headlines that would have had the market up 40 percent three years ago, five years ago. Um, markets kind of like, yeah, good news, not, you know, not incredible news. The market's not rallying. Uh, market rallied, you know, three or five percent. Um, some names a little bit more. Um, the the steady progress in terms of what I think is rescheduling in the U.S. continues, and and we we get we get a lot of comments. I, you know, clearly this is a question whether the political, um, you, you know, the the uh, what do you call that glass thing that sand that you know, dips through it? So whatever. Hourglass. The hourglass. Sorry. Still haven't finished <laughs> my coffee. Um, <laughs> the hourglass is is you know, picking away on the Biden administration's status quo and their ability to really dictate the terms of this. Remember, uh, the DEA essentially is you know appointed by the Biden administration. I mean, everybody involved in this circle that has to bring cannabis into a rescheduling environment. Uh, now, meanwhile, uh, you know, a couple of the cannabis companies have already announced that they've received IRS refunds and that they're well on their way to to actually, you know, essentially removing, uh, if not, you know, synthetically or in advance of a change in 280E and taxation on the sector. Uh, the profitability of the free cash flow for the sector 
um, gets better and better. The biggest issue for the sector right now is that it can't be institutionally owned properly. And that means that, yeah, hedge funds can own it plenty. You know, there's obviously a couple of the companies like Terrace and Cureleaf that have listed up in Toronto, world-class exchange. Uh, I can just tell you from, from, you know, I run a cannabis ETF, CNBS, and from just the, the portfolio construction for me, um, my compliance people, once I was able to own uh, Cure Leaf in Toronto, you know, the key was really, they didn't need to know anything else other than it was listed on the TSX. That immediately meant, check, we're good. Um, and, and so, you know, in terms of owning the sector, even dedicated funds like mine have had issues, have had significant issues. I own most of my U.S. exposure via swap. That's fine. It's, it, it works. It works just as well. But for a lot of institutions, that's the issue. So I, I think, you know, the slow march of positive headlines will continue. Um, they're not we're not necessarily dependent on Washington for anything. Those are very important elements of investment in the sector. But but uh, as we've seen over the last couple of quarters, the companies are actually, you know, we hear about Facebook and the year of efficiency. It's been like it's been like the three years of efficiency in, in cannabis. And I think the companies are better run. But, you know, we've heard from Truly. They've gotten they've gotten tax refunds. Uh, we've heard from other companies. We 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 see what's potentially going on on rescheduling. We see what's going on in terms of the global adoption. This is a global economy uh, in cannabis. And, and so, and, and meanwhile, in the U.S., the, the steady kind of march of state by state, including probably the most recent and significant one, which is Ohio, which is arguably a red state, um, and, you know, that the more red states go to Washington with cannabis having been, you know, essentially uh, the adult markets having been opened up, let alone the, the I mean, the, 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 med the, excuse me, the medical markets are one thing, but I just think that the state by state progress here is part of why over the medium to long term, there's no question about what's happening here. There's no question where it's eventually going to go. Investors that are here now are, are certainly going to be rewarded. Um, not every company is worth owning. And a lot of companies have completely, uh, you know, really blown up their balance sheets to stay alive. And that means that they're, you know, and I urge investors, uh, this is what we do too. Uh, you, you have to look at look the, 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 the caps structure the cap stack, understand where there's, you know, 4 billion warrants that are coming online, just 20% up. You know, there's there's a lot of different elements of investing here that are not what meets the eye. Like, oh, these companies seem cheap on a, you know, on an EV the dot. Some of them are cheap, but some of them, if you actually look at the full dilution, um, are not cheap at all. So um, exciting times in cannabis. Uh, we had Boris Jordan from Cureleaf on Fast Money last night. Always a great conversation with Boris. I and, saw it. You know, yeah, one of the things I said was, hey, Boris, your stock didn't really move today. Um, and that's not like the kind of question I like to ask. And it wasn't that I was trying to, 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 to kind of dig at him. I was purely pointing that I actually think in its own way, it's actually good news. Um, I think there are things happening in the cannabis space that are actually really positive, really fundamental and, and material that a lot of people outside the sector aren't paying attention to. And the, in the fact that the industry is not moving 10 or 20 or 30 percent on those days, I actually take it as a positive. And is there a path to profit, Tim? Is there a path to profitability for any of these companies, like a, like a path? Because I think you'd get like more institutional, you know, interest here if these stocks actually started showing profits here, which you know they've they've struggled to do for a long time. Is there a path to profitability on some of these companies? So I mean, first of all, the, 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 they are showing profitability right now. They're showing profitability. Okay, so we're getting in, there abs in absolute terms and, and, okay. and, in, and in real terms. But then the adjusted profitability. Um, which is a function of this 280E taxation will change, you know, remarkably the profitability of the sector. But you're bringing up a really important point. There's a lot of institutions out there for the last three years have come to me and said, Tim, I can own cannabis at my hedge fund, um, or there are institutional investors that can own cannabis. But they say, you know what, my biggest issue is I'm not even sure what multiple I'm looking at. Like what, no. you know, yeah. I, I can't tell you what really the, the, the growth multiple should be on this. Is it actually a lot cheaper than consumer staples. I think it's cheaper than consumer discretionary. What category do I put it in? So I, I think the, the the investable kind of analysis profile of cannabis has been a challenge for traditional investors who, who want to own it. Um, but who still, you know, they don't need to worry about missing the first 20 or 80 percent. Right. And I don't think they do because I think they're going to get it. So, um, it, you know, the size of the marketplace, the addressable market, it, 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 it's all over the map in terms of what people are willing to call it. Maybe one of the biggest problems with cannabis is the is the illicit market. There's no question. Um, as I walk, you know, to my office today, and I see I see 25 illegal you know, pot shops, and and you know, I, I in New York in New York City, right? Yeah, yeah, New yeah, York City. City and, and, and and look, I mean, 
and I'll, I'll get a ticket for jaywalking, but they won't they won't hassle these guys. I I own a bar downtown, um, WXOU Radio Bar, which is a pretty cool little place. Um, and and if I tried to open without a liquor license, I'd be shut down so fast. I mean, so it's fast. extraordinary to me that community boards that have a, a by the way a disproportionate uh, weight in terms of what kind of uh, you know really what kind of commerce goes on within their boundaries and there's there's seven or eight uh, you know community boards that around Manhattan but I mean it, it the fact that these uh, illicit shops have been able to exist especially in a world where we really are truly worried about uh, you know fentanyl and and all the legal influences that that really are the reason why cannabis uh, it's great that it's it's coming you know out of the out of the alleys into into real stores and being treated the way it should be treated. So, hey Tim, yeah. I want to shift gears here real quick yeah, before we let you go. I know you got a busy schedule here, a lot of things going on in this market, but I think everything is predicated on what the Fed is going to do. We get some inflation data on Friday. Paul, speaking on Friday, where the markets are closed, you made a very interesting observation. Uh, if rates are supposed to be going down, right, why are, why are yields rising despite all these expectations? Maybe we're not going to get those three cuts. What do you think about that, Tim? That, that, that's that's the conversation we've been having for a couple of weeks, for a few weeks on Fast Money. I, I, I'm not sure we will. Um, I think we have... Uh, I think we have inflationary forces. We all, you know, done the, the work on services inflation and, and whatnot. I mean, I, I think there's 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 some real issues here. Um, I also think that the Fed last week did a terrible job uh, of managing expectations. They basically said we're going to cut no matter what, um, and I'm not sure that they should be. I, I look at, at you know financial conditions and they're off the charts. Um, now there are some things lurking that, that would have me concerned. And, and I do think asset prices, the BOE said some really interesting things today about they, they see a real threat to asset prices. I do too. Uh, I think commercial real estate is is a massive issue um, that dwarfs subprime, by the way, that, that people just don't really understand. It's not just the regional banks with their exposure. It's how about all these other, uh, you know, institute, how about the pension funds? How about the endowments? How about, uh, you know, a lot of Main Street that owns this stuff and they don't even know they own it. So um, I, I, I think that the Fed really needs to hold hold the line here. And, and either way, um, I, I, again, I'll just take it back to New York City. I know what's going on um, with commercial real estate here. And I know how that's also feeding into residential real estate. Um, and then you have some of these just you know, demographic patterns that, that continue. Uh, I think they're probably overdone, by the way, of like New Yorkers moving to Texas and Florida and people from Chicago moving to Texas and Florida and California. Uh, you know, my my buddy lives in Houston, sent me a hat the other day that said, get your California out of my Texas. And I said, dude, I'm in New York, man. I mean, you probably don't like us either. And he said, no, we like the New Yorkers. We hate the people from California. Sorry about that, Sunshine. Uh, sorry, Golden State. But I mean, that's what they say in Texas. Anyway, um, yeah, the Fed, it's all about the Fed. Everybody says this is all about AI. No, it's all about the Fed. And, and, and I think we have... Uh, uh, you know, I try to be a lot more, call it pragmatic with the view I have on the equity market, which is the equity market I have right now, I think is going to continue to go higher. Um, and I think there are places to allocate the broader economy is, is uh, uh, you know, industrial names, uh, transports, uh, energy, healthcare, uh, utilities. I, mean, I think a lot of these these companies have been in two year bear markets and they look kind of interesting here. So I know I'm running on here. So um, oh, that's OK. But, oh, no, I that's just. The market, the market's held up when rates went from zero to five percent, right? And we've come down. If we come down, I mean, who says? I mean, you can't. It, the market performs so well in that environment. You did give a sector here. You said industrials. Is there any other sectors um, that you are radar? Maybe. What about the whole small cap thing? Everyone's waiting for that catch up trade. Are, I, you know, I, that, get, I get a lot of hate now because I've, I've said a couple of times in the last month or two when someone's come on and talked about small caps, and I, I mean, I just. I don't know why we spend so much time focused on small caps. I mean, I, I understand there's a market there um, and I understand it, there's a lot of money to be made. But but um, I, I don't I don't you know, I don't really care about small. They're caps. small for a reason, right? I, 
The, I don't, what I mean, you're saying, though, it's all institutional money. Like, this has been the problem with small caps for years here now. It's like, why bother when I got the NVIDIAs and I got the Microsofts and I got, you know, it was always Apple, but it's not Apple right now. I mean, why bother with the small caps? You know, nobody's talking about them in the media. Nobody's, you know, and, and again, so what you're saying is so typical. How do we change that mindset? Like, like if we're going to have a small cap, uh, like, catch-up trade here, we need that mindset to change. But, but this, I don't but, know if it does. But the small cap catch up trade is you might as well allocate to uh, a, a mid size, you know, a mid cap growth company, um, because I, I, I just feel like um, it, look, you're diversified. You own the IWM, you're diversified. That's great. You, you know, I, I often have used the IWM historically as a hedge against growth sectors, especially in emerging markets. It's often been, you know, like, you know, you're kind of one brain cell uh, hedges. Let me let me short the IWM against owning some other growth stuff, because obviously it, it is more tethered to. To a growth dynamic, but um, you know, so the, the hate mail will keep coming um, because I, I just I don't you know I, I respect the analysis of what performance in small caps means to the broader market, but I don't you know I think again there's a capacity issue for investing in small caps for a lot of institutions. They don't even bother. Um, why would they bother? So, um, but I understand why we talk about it. I just don't care. All right. Well, we've been on the line with Tim Seymour. Tim, we we you and I met uh, last year at the Cannabis Capital Conference at Benzing, and you gave me yeah. some great great tips for being on air, on camera. Of course, you see Tim on CNBC, Fast Money all the time. So if I do anything well on this show, I'm on camera. It's because of Tim's advice. If I do anything not so well, it's because I'm not following his advice. So Tim, I appreciate. <laughs> well, one, of, one of the first things I probably taught you is to be humble um, and and to to you know to acknowledge that that. Uh, there are a lot of people out there doing great things. You guys are doing great things. And and uh, I hope we're actually going to have a little preview conversation before that conference in, in uh, Fort Lauderdale, Hollywood, Florida, April 16th and 17th, because that's going to be a really exciting event. And, you know, we can drill a little bit deeper into cannabis going into that. But uh, it was great to meet you. And, you know, if if. I, I bet I talked. I, if, look, I bet I gave you tips on hockey, and I bet I was right. Oh, um, exactly. I probably talked about. I probably talked about the Rangers. You know, making a run at the Presidents Cup. Um, so their first you know, team to clinch. First team to clinch officially yesterday. Game set. It takes the game seventy-two. One of the best seasons we've ever had in the regular season, and and it, this is why the NHL is amazing. It, it's why you know I don't care whether you're a hockey fan or not. When the NHL playoffs are coming up, uh, oh, you're gonna crazy. have you're gonna have sixteen teams. Uh, eight in each conference. I'm telling you, each one of those first round playoff series is going to be epic. It's 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 incredible what what's going on. So um, love me some hockey. Uh, Rangers clinched last night in a wild game against the Flyers, who are playing pretty good hockey this year. Yeah, they are. Um, even though they're Philly. And uh, yeah. oh, my wings could sneak in there. I hope my well, wings can sneak uh, in there. They, they're trying. They're just like they're there. They're they're teetering. They're teetering. They're, 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 they're right there. They lost thought, last night, but I thought they were. I thought they were a given a month ago. I know. Um, then Larkin they, they, got hurt. Dylan Larkin got hurt. But I'll tell you one thing. I mean, you admire a lot of different athletes. I mean, those hockey players. I mean, they're out there for a minute and a half, two minutes, and I mean. Just full tilt. I mean, they may even be in better shape than swimmers, and I think that that might be a little strange. Well, they're in better shape than me, and and I can <laughs> tell you that that uh, I love Patrick Kane, and it's great to see him. Even just the influence he has, he's a legend, and um, I, I think the Leafs are doing all the right things. It's interesting. It's a young team. There's a lot of talent there, and it's not surprising. It's all the cliches. You know, you kind of see younger teams that have a, you know they struggle right now. Um, they struggle also really understanding, you know, younger guys, even where maybe they've burnt through uh, all their reserve tanks of, 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 of energy and whatnot. This part of the season, it's a long season, but wings are on the right path. And, and uh, uh, you got to watch that 30 for 30 on the avalanche and the wings. Um, uh, oh, it, it's, it's, yeah. It is so good. And whether you're a hockey fan or not, um, it is it's, that's must watch TV. Awesome. Well, we've been on the line again with Tim Seymour, CNBC's Fast Money. He will be at Benzinga's Cannabis Conference uh, moderating a panel on valuation variances, determining worth in the cannabis space. Like you said, Tim, we might have to bring you back on for, yeah. a, quick, for a quick preview right before that. Um, but, you know, we know you're a busy guy. Enjoy the rest of your day and we'll catch up soon. Thanks, guys. Great to be here. No, thank you. Thank you for coming on.
All right, guys. Again, Tim Seymour. Shout out, Tim. Great guy. Like I said, met him Great last guy. year at the Cannabis Conference, was giving me all sorts of tips and really, I mean, took the time to do it, which I can't appreciate enough. So thank you again, Tim. But all right, guys, it's 9-10. We've kept oh. long enough. We'll go ahead and wrap up today's show. We do have Benzinga Live Trading starting up right after this. Should be another exciting day in the market. You got DJT trading. You got GameStop, everything going on. So we'll have a lot to talk about tomorrow at 8 a.m. Joel, who do we got coming on tomorrow? Well, it doesn't look like I'll be walking on my hands down to the office uh, because it doesn't look like Merck's going to open at 1.33. So keep an eye oh, on it. you're going to be okay. Might not open, even open at one. We give you an opening and balance for it. It's seventeen thousand to buy. Projected opening at this time is one twenty eight ninety nine. Uh-huh. Again, change. Yeah, but the the when you're nine eleven, the projected opening doesn't mean much. I mean, okay. you know, this is this is like information that the pros are using. I mean, when you're sitting here on a brokerage and you don't have, you know, like I can look at, you know, how many buy orders are out there. I can look at, you know, where it's projected. So right now, coming information coming directly from the floor. From the floor, the projected opening is 128.99, but that doesn't mean much. It's probably going to be more buyers come in. They'll push that projected opening up. All that is saying is if it opened right now, it would open at 128.99 with all the opening order flow. So some more buy orders will come in, probably push that up. But you know what naturally happens is people sell it in the pre market. They think it's going to you know come down to that price. And then, you know, they, they short in the pre-market and they turn around, they come up to buy. And that's what brings up that opening price. I think it'll open above 130. Uh, yes. But you're right, Joel. There's probably some size there at 130. Maybe this is going to be a 130 open for Merck. What about all those other levels? What about the half and the whole levels going so all the way not up? not on Merck as much. And, no? and I think it's more, you, you got it right with the big, you know, the big number, like 130. Okay. I bet that there's some size sitting there, you know, at 130. And I got cheap and unsubscribed from my booker. I could actually tell you that. But um, just because the New York book just didn't seem worth the 60 bucks a month anymore. I just wasn't getting very many trades from it at all. But. Well, um, 130 is probably size there. And uh, just market, I mean, we're just floating up here, uh, right back up to the top of yesterday's range. So uh, keep an eye on that. That uh, comes in. The, the Globex high was above that, but uh, potential resistance here at the 5295 area. That was your interday high from yesterday. Coming back on the downside, I don't, man, you're a long ways from unchanged. So uh, maybe perhaps keep an eye mid range in the session. If we do go into a decline, Mark Shake and joining us tomorrow to end the week. I hope you guys uh, enjoyed this extended uh, PMP. So uh, we will be back with you guys yeah, much tomorrow like, morning. Much like overtime hockey, you instead of you know free hockey, you got free PMP in extra 13 minutes. But now we'll uh, we'll let you guys get on with the day. Go to Benzinga Live Trade, and we'll see you guys tomorrow, 8 a.m.